<clears throat> All right, thank you. Thanks for that uh, introduction and the invitation. Um, I, uh, yeah, as JP said, I'll be talking about some composition stuff today. Uh, here's some contact info if you wanna ask any questions kind of offline. Um, and, and then as JP said, I, um, if you don't know anything about me, I do uh, like consulting with companies under uh, my company Point Free, which I, I run with my collaborator, Stephen Sellis. Um, and we also do this educational uh, video series. Um, and, and what I'm gonna talk about tonight isn't, isn't anything that's been like fully codified and, and talked about um, on, on the series, but it's, it's very much a part of that. So if you find this interesting, you might find some of that interesting. And so we have a, a ton to cover and, and we wanna kinda answer this question of, of what is composition. Um, and it's, it's one of those words that comes up a ton in programming and, uh, but we don't very often hear a very succinct, rigorous definition of what composition is. And that's kind of a bummer because composition for whatever reason is this word that kind of gets, it gets used. And, and if someone says that, oh, this thing has composition, it's almost as if it's been blessed to, to like, it has lots of power. We all just understand that, yet each of us thinks of composition probably in a slightly different way. And it's, and it's kind of strange that programmers don't settle on that definition so that, so that everyone can speak the same language. And so um, we are going to first try to formulate a concise definition of composition to get everyone on, on the same page. Um, and giving it that concise definition should encompass everything that you currently today think of as composition, but maybe there'll be lots of interesting examples of composition that you just never even thought of before. And, and we say we're gonna try to formulate it because the proper way to formulate this requires a bit of like work to like kind of maybe do some math and like really get it like concise and, and rigorous, but we can't really do that stuff. We, we just need to try to see a glimpse of what's possible. Um, and then once the stage is set for this definition of composition, we are gonna just go through a ton of examples, like, like a, a, a feel like a fever dream, a flurry of examples so that we can see just how ubiquitous this thing is. Um, and the, the hope is by going through like the seemingly pedantic exercise of defining something like composition is that we would be able to just more easily see it in the, in the things that we do every day. It, it does actually unlock real things in, in everyday code. Um, and so the definition we'll start with is super simple, just to literally mean a process that combines two objects of a type into a third ob into another object of that same type. Uh, and we're already in a bit of a trouble here because we're now using two terms that we also have not yet defined. What is an object and what is a process? So it's like I'm, I'm using undefined things in order to define this thing, but I think people would feel maybe a little bit more comfortable saying a process in their minds, they maybe have more intuition of what that means, and an object, maybe they have more intuition of what that means. So we're gonna go with this kind of loose definition since we can't use the, the like the kind of hardcore mathematical definition. Um, and so like some examples, just to get our feet wet, functions are, are obviously composable. If you have a function from A to B, a function from B to C, you compose them, you get a function from A to C. Here, process is literally a function and an object is a type, but maybe a little bit more exotic would be um, the, the kind of adage that we all hear from object-oriented programming of prefer composition over inheritance. This is maybe the first time we've, we even hear of composition in programming. Um, and the idea is that often when we reach for inheritance, maybe you could actually use something called composition. That thing isn't usually defined, but what it usually means is instead of A inheriting from B, you would maybe create a C that holds an A and a B, and you would kind of you would use it to, to not inherit, but kind of encapsulate two behaviors in, in one class. Um, and so instead like that, I guess object composition is also composition because you take two classes and kind of cram them together into another class and that's like object composition. But even maybe more exotic would be like, maybe code generation could be thought of as, as composition because you just kind of annotate all these little things in your code and you maybe have sorcery or some kind of code generation thing that goes in, looks at all those annotations, kind of collects them together and decides I'm gonna implement a whole new class or struct or some kind of thing based off all those annotations. So maybe we could even think of code generation as composition. But what we're seeing here is in the programming world, there's a bit of a spectrum of how powerful or useful a particular composition is because um, like maybe functions, objects, and code generation can be thought of as composition, but maybe some of these are easier to work with than other things. 
uh, like functions are probably the easiest to work with because you can literally compose them together, write a generic function that composes them. Objects are maybe not as easy to use because it's kind of ad hoc. You have to like sit down, write that third class, encapsulate the behavior of two other classes and, and kind of do some work there. And then code generation is certainly the most complicated one of these three because you need like build infrastructure. You need to be able to precisely determine the exact moment to generate new code and when to invalidate that. And like, this is a very seriously difficult problem. So there's definitely a spectrum here and it's useful to keep that in mind so that you would know why would you maybe prefer one type of composition over another type of composition. And so with that definition in place, like we'll go like through a tour of a zoo of composability to just see all the wild types of composition that exist in the world. Um, and so, like I said, functions are composable because you can literally write this generic function that takes an A to B, a B to C, and you get an A to C. You can just implement this. But uh, functions are so composable that you can even tweak the output of functions and still get something that's composable. Like you can take partial functions, functions that map into an optional, and you don't destroy the composability. If you go from A to optional B, B to optional C, you still can implement an A to optional C. But also failable functions or exceptional functions, if you map into the result type, you still don't destroy composability. If you go A to result, B to result, you can do A to result. Um, a non-function example would be that class composition kind of thing. Uh, say you had a class that encapsulated the behavior of getting like a, a person's, a, a person's uh, current location, and then you had a class that had encapsulated the behavior of searching for points of interest, and you wanted to make a class that encapsulated the behavior of getting a user's current position and then using that to get some recommendations of points of interest for that user. And if all we knew of for composing things was inheritance, we would be tempted to, to do this with inheritance where we would maybe take the location manager and enhance its behavior with the concept of a, of a POI searcher. And then we would inherit from that to enhance the POI searcher with the behavior of finding recommendations. And we would just go down this road, but object com uh, composition just says, just encapsulate both those classes into a new class and then expose an API that makes sense for, for what a recommendations manager would do. Um, and it's, it's worth noting that uh, the, the, this, this composition over inheritance thing in OOP, it's, it's only a guideline. It's just a, like a, Kind of, it's an adage. It's a, it's a, some recommendation. It's not something we can actually codify into a program. There is no concept of, of like really writing a program that takes two classes and then composes them and gives you that third class. It's something ad hoc that you just sit down and do. Uh, protocols maybe are composable because we have this ampersand character where you just kind of, you know, put that between two protocols and you get a whole new protocol that then takes the union of all their requirements. Um, and this is certainly composition based off of our like very you know simple definition but again it's it's not quite as as powerful as maybe it could be because we can never ever in user land implement this ampersand it's just like this is out of our hands only the compiler can do this um, but but it's an example of of composition and you know there it is um, keypads are something that's composable because if you have a keypad from a to b and b to c you can use the method appending to stick them together and then you get a key path from A to C. Uh, even nicer, if you use backslash to generate a literal key path, you can then just use dot to compose key paths. You can just dot and go deeper and deeper into some structure. And so this is kind of satisfying our definition of composition. Um, and we, and it's pretty nice. It's very close to the idea of functions. However, there's still a lot of things that key paths uh, are that are out of our hands when it comes to keypads. We we could have the concept of if you have a keypad from A to B and a keypad from A to C, one could think that you might better construct a keypad from A to B and C, where you can just focus on both of those parts of A. However, we can't write this function. Uh, this is out of our hands. We also couldn't write the appending method on keypad. Only the compiler can can do this for us. So. It's like composable, it's nice, but on the spectrum, it's maybe not quite as far to the, the side of like very powerful that we, we might hope. And so right there, that's already a pretty impressive set of like uh, ideas of composition, but we're kind of like really still only at the entrance of the zoo of composability. There's, we haven't really ventured far in because these are, those were all very obvious examples. 
Um, and so let's like push through and like go explore more parts of uh, the zoo. I don't know if we take our definition very literally, then maybe integers are composable because you can literally stick two integers together and you get another one. And maybe they're even doubly composable because you can multiply integers. Is, are we going to allow this, you know, to call this composition? Uh, strings, are these composable because you can append strings? Um, these are like such simple examples, but it kind of seems strange to allow these into our zoo. It'd be like in a real life zoo, if there's like a dedicated exhibit to like, like showing off pigeons or something, it's like, yeah, sure, they're animals, but that's like, that just really seems to degenerate the, the whole rest of the zoo to like have an exhibit for pigeons. This is like, are we really going to allow these things? But the answer is yes, we should allow these things. Um, optionals, we should probably allow them because we can coalesce them together. We should probably allow results in because we could implement this function that takes two results and just takes the first successful. This is kind of like the generalization of null coale coalescing. Arrays, we can concatenate them. Dictionaries, we can merge them. Any reactive library out there, uh, whether it's combined, React Swift, Reactive Swift, or Rx Swift, well, they come with merge operations, um, but they're maybe so exotic that they support other forms of composition. You can concatenate them together so that once X is finished, the Y's start, or you can race two of them so that the first of X's and Y's that finishes or that that starts, that will be the one you choose from from that point forward. And so, like we're seeing more things that maybe we we shouldn't we wouldn't have ever considered as composition because they just seem um, we just don't think of them in, the, in that way. But but certainly it satisfies that very basic definition. And so now we want to go like deeper, like maybe like off road in the zoo. We want to like see some really weird exotic stuff. And and we'll start by looking at zip. This will be like our first moment to see what is what's really weird in this world. Uh, because zip, if you strip away all the syntax that you can see in the standard library, there's like a lot there, but at its core, it's really just this function that takes an array of A's and array of B's and returns an array of A's and B's. And it's kind of doing a transformation on arrays and tuples. It's saying it can cha change a tuple of arrays to an array of tuple. And so when said like that, tuple of arrays to array of tuple, we, there's maybe more things. There's maybe a tuple of optionals to an optional tuple, a tuple of results to a results to a result of tuples, a tuple of dictionaries to a dictionary of tuples, or a tuple of streams to a stream of tuples. Uh, these are all like perfectly sensible things to do. Um, Combine even defines this for their stream and Reactive Swift and Rx Swift. The other ones, the dictionary, the result, and the optional, the standard library does not define these, but it could, and it'd be completely valid to do. And so we would may be tempted to say now zip is a form of composition where it's a process that combines two objects of the same type into a third of the same type. But if we're gonna be like super pedantic and super strict with ourselves, are we allowed to say that although we, we are combining two arrays into a third array, the types don't actually match up. But we have an array of A's, array of B's, and then array of A's and B's. And so we could maybe fudge our definition. We could just say we are gonna allow this because you know we clearly you know want this thing. Uh, but the interesting thing is, the really powerful thing is that we don't have to fudge the definition. We can keep as strict of a definition as we want, and we can just look at this problem in a slightly different way, and we'll see that underneath the hood, it really is expressing ideas of combining two things into one. And, and so this is a form of composition, even from our basic example or our basic definition, we don't have to fudge any definitions. We can keep the nice strict definition. Um, but uh, before we get there, let's like start a little bit simpler. Could, could we say that map is is compositional in some way? Uh, standard library defines four different map operations on arrays, optionals, dictionaries, and results. That's kind of surprising if if you've never really like why why are there so many maps? Why is this why is the standard library defining all these maps? Um, and then if you open up to combine, combine also has a map. Uh, and so if you if you look at it a little bit differently, you will see a form of composition lurking uh, inside here. And that is, rather than thinking of map as like a method on those types where you do dot map and you give a transform dot map, uh, kind of flip things around a little bit and see that it's nothing more than a, a way of transforming functions that go from A to B to the, to the generic type. So it takes an A to B to an array of A's to array of B's, and you can transform your a to B into a function from optional A to optional B. 
and all these things. All right. So so this is this is like the basic shape uh, of map. And if we squint really hard and let all the syntax fade away and, and the name result and stream fade away, it kind of looks like this, where it's it's when you define map, you're allowing yourself to to change any function that goes between regular types A and B into the function that goes f of A to f of B. Uh, and so in your mind, you can substitute optional result array or anything for f, and you'll you'll recover that that map signature. And so what if you had two of them? Like what if you had uh, an f and a g that supports this thing? You you could take your a to b and you can turn it into the f of a to f of b, and you could take your a to b and turn it to a g to a g to b. Well, what if we like stack them on top of each other and we do the f of g of a? Like, can we do this? Given that we know that we have, oh, sorry. Given that we know we have uh, f and g with the map, can we also define map here? And an answer is yes. Like, uh, I'll leave that as an exercise, but no matter what f and g are, you can have array of results, streams of optionals, whatever it is, you can define this map operation. And, and so what we're seeing is that if f is some generic type that supports map and g is some generic type that supports map, then yes, indeed, f of g and g of f support map. Um, and so there is something lurking underneath the hood that, that shows that we can have a combination of two things uh, given us a third thing of the same type. Uh, and the same is true for zip. If you can zip f and you can zip g, then you can also zip f of g and g of f. Um, so if you have a stream of arrays, you can zip those streams, which then under the hood, zip those arrays. Um, a little bit more complicated is, is flat map. And that's kind of the third, the third kind of functional trio operation. Uh, flat map is also defined uh, all over the standard library. Uh, so where map allows us to kind of take our generic type, open it up and apply a transformation to it, and then kind of close it back up, that's what we can think of how it works on optionals and results and arrays. Um, zip allows us to kind of do something similar, except you have lots of generic types and you kind of independently, kind of in parallel, open them all up together, do some kind of transformation with all those values and then put them into back into that generic type as like a big old tuple. Um, flat map does something similar. It's like the next step of, of power where you then get to sequence these computations, these like these generic types, you get to open up the type apply a transfer like apply a computation that that returns a generic type and then kind of chain along um and so if you if you had an array of x's you can flat map and uh in the flat map you can return an array that just sends back dollar sign zero and then squares dollar sign zero and this will all get flattened down into just one you know flat array um if you have an optional you can safely unwrap the optional and try to then do some other operation, uh, some other partial operation, like you know, if it's a multiple of two, you'll you'll square it. Otherwise, you know, you decide you don't like uh, odd numbers and you, or even numbers and you, uh, or odd numbers and you return nil. Uh, and the result does something similar, except you you now get to send back a failure message to say uh, what why it is that you're gonna you're gonna return a, 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 a not an integer. Uh, and then the same thing with streams. So, so can we see flat map as some kind of compositional thing? Um, if this is the signature, then it just means that, you know, when you have your generic type M of A and you have a way of changing A's into M of B's, you can ultimately get a, a M of B. And so that's, that's what all of these examples are demonstrating. And so where the composition comes in is the idea that flat map is actually two things in one. They're not, they're not, uh, it hasn't been broken down into its its real base units because uh, inside you've got the idea of mapping, just like like all the examples we already discussed, and then you you flatten it. So when you when you map this array, you would get a doubly nested array, and then you need to flatten that that doubly nested array. And so the flattening operation is actually the real atomic unit sitting inside flat map. Uh, this is the, the actual interesting thing that flat map gives us, and and now we see two things combining into one thing. We see an M of a M of A combining somehow into an M of A. So this is just a just a like a, a a brief look at where the composition is hiding in here. But within each of map, zip, and flat map, there is composition hiding in there. 
And so we don't have to change our definition. We can just say composition is the combination, the combining of two things of the same type into something, into a third object of the same type. And, and then we've like really kind of maybe opened the Pandora's box at this point, because now it's not only are we allowing things that are very obviously combining two things into one, but we're now allowing anything that has map, zip, flat map, all those things, they're being allowed into the zoo of uh, composability. And, um, and I mean, this can be interesting because it just really it shows us that composition is far more pervasive than maybe we would think at first. It, it kind of really gets its fingers in a lot of things. There's a lot of things in the standard library to support it, but there's also a lot of real world things that we might want to use that also support this. Um, oddly, random number generators. Uh, if you probably know maybe that uh, Swift, I think 4.2 introduced randomness API, or maybe, maybe 4.1. Uh, and it is a really wonderful unit of composability. But if you only saw what the standard library gave us, you, you would never see that. Because uh, what the standard library gave us was some static functions uh, where you can just do int dot random and bool dot random and you get random values out of it. But really underneath the hood, there's a unit of composition. Um, and it looks like this. It says that if that if you want to produce random values of any type A, not just ints and booleans like the standard library uh, gives us, what you need is first a base unit of randomness, this RNG, which is a black box that produces randomness in some gigantic huge space of U int 64s. If you have just that base unit, which this is the, the real thing that the standard library gives us, the, the system random number generator. If you just have that base unit, then I will tell you how to produce random A's. Um, and it's in out because every time you run the random number generator, you change the black box. The black box keeps changing every time you run it. Um, and from this base unit, you can start exploring what it means to have a generator of random ints, booleans, which is what the standard library gives you, but strings, standard library says nothing about random strings, random user models. If in your own domain, you can generate random values of users, generator of random UI images. If you want to do some generative art, random functions, like it's, it's now in your hands because you have this like generic, this generic signature. And then the cool thing is that this type supports everything that we've been discussing so far. So it supports map. And you would use it by saying, if you had a base unit of like say int random number generator, you could map on it with an ordinal function that turns it now into a random generator of ordinal numbers. Uh, so just with like one quick line, bam, you get now random ordinal numbers. You get a new generator that generates, you know, fifth, third, first. Uh, but you can also zip generators. So you can take two generators, run them, and then collect their values in, in a tuple which would mean if you had a generator of strings in addition to the generator of int, you could zip them together and then map on it with a user initializer, and now you get random users. Um, you can flat map on generators, and this is useful for running a random generator to get a value and then doing additional randomness based off of that first random value you got. So for example, if you wanted a randomly sized array of random elements, well, give it a random generator of A's and a random generator of count to, uh, of integers to say how big the array would be. And then you can do count, flat map it. Now you have a random count or random size and then fill it in with a bunch of random values. You can also combine two generators into one just by randomly choosing one of the generators and then running that generator to get some random stuff out of it. And so if you had an int between one and 10 and and it's between 100 and 1,000. You just randomly choose one of those and then run that one. And why would you do this? Because these units of composition are the, are the way of breaking large problems into small problems. It's, this is, these little tools are what you allow you to think of that. So if I wanted to make, cook up a random generator to generate passwords like this, which I think this is what Safari, the format uh, Safari gives you, you could start with the most basic thing, something that we, we can definitely do. Let's just pick a random element from the string of alphanumeric characters. And from that, we can derive a password segment, like one of those little segments between the hyphens where, well, I'm gonna take a random collection of those alphanumerics and I, want, I just want six of them, uh, six random ones, and then map on it to turn it into a string. And then the password, the entire password is take three of those random password segments and then 
join them with a hyphen. And so you just can break like kind of complex problems into very small understandable units. But random number generators aren't the only thing that, that can do this. Also, parsers can do this. Uh, so a parser would just be the idea of taking some kind of nebulous blob of data, in, the, in this case, a string, and you want to try to parse some amount of the string off of it to possibly re return an A. But it has to be optional because maybe parsing fails. Uh, like if you're trying to parse the word dog into an int, that would probably fail. Um, so say you had an int parser that just parsed off the integer from the beginning of a string. And if you had the input string of one, two, three, dog, and you ran your int parser on that, you would get back the one, two, three, because it did successfully get one, two, three off the beginning of dog. And then the input would have been mutated because you consumed one, two, three from the string and you were left with dog. Now dog is what you have left to parse, however you want to parse that. And parsers support all the operations we're, we're talking about. You can map on them, which means if you have the ability to parse ints, you can map on it with ordinal. And now you have a parser that produces ordinal numbers. So if you parse three dog, you'll get the value third from that and you'll have dog left to, left to parse. And you can zip these parsers, which means if you had a, a parser of ints and a parser of strings, you can zip them, map it with the user initializer, and now you can parse 42 blob into the user with ID 42 and name blob. Uh, you can flat map on them, which means you can parse a little bit and then use and do logic based off of what you parse in order to continue parsing. And so what if you, at the beginning of your string, you had a little bit, a little indicator of um, <clears throat> a version. And so you, you parse maybe the first two characters to say the version of this format. And from that, you decide, well, if it's V1, I'll use my V1 parser for the rest of the string. If it's V2, I'll use my V2 parser for the rest of the string. And otherwise, I'll use the legacy parser. And then you can combine two parsers in a one, where you just try the first parser. And if it succeeds, you take it. But if it fails, you try the next parser. And so we could try parsing the literal string of New York City and then map it to the, the NYC location and Berlin and London. And so we get to try to choose one of these parsers. And then again, you get to take all these nice compositional tools and break complex problems into very simple, well understood small problems. So say we wanted to parse this format. Uh, well, we, we see it's a, like a double followed by a degree sign followed by an N where N indicates that the double is technically positive and S if we're doing South for this coordinate, it would technically correspond to a negative 40 degree uh, latitude. And then a, a comma, another double, a degree sign, and then a W or an E. So first let's try to think of how, we, how can we parse the N, the N, S, E, W. Well, North, South, we can just parse one single character off. And if that succeeds, we'll flat map on it to then decide how do we want to continue parsing. If it's N, we'll just say, all right, that's a one, that, it's positive. If it's an S, we'll say it's negative one, and otherwise we'll fail. And we'll just, we'll stop parsing because we parsed something that wasn't in RNS, and, that, and that's all that's allowed. And we'll, we can do the identical thing for East and West. And then the next step is we can try parsing off a single latitude thing. So we can parse off a double, we'll zip up some, some parsers, we'll parse a double, then we'll parse the literal of a degree sign, and then we'll parse that north-south uh, sign. And then we'll map on it to just multiply the two. That way, 40 south becomes a negative 40, and 40 east becomes a negative 40. And then we'll do the same thing for longitude. And then we'll zip up those parsers to say, now I'm going to parse my latitude, then I'm going to parse my comma, and then I'm going to parse my longitude, and then take that and bundle it up into a coordinate struct or something. And so we, we break, broken down a, like a pretty significant problem down into lots of little pieces. Um, each of these pieces can be understood in isolation very well. Um, and we are just leveraging all of these like little compositional operators. Um, <clears throat> and so we could run it and there's some successful things we could do, but if we put like an X instead of a, a North or a South, it would fail to, to parse that. But then also asynchronous values fit into this world. So, so this is the, the base unit signature of promises and, and reactive libraries. It's the ability to hand, to asynchronously deal with values. You, you hand someone else this aid avoid function, this callback function, and then they get to invoke it and send you values whenever they want. It is the base unit of how can you decouple um, getting values immediately and allow other people to send you values. 
all the operators and everything you can define on this. Even more generally, continuations where you don't just go A to void to void, but you go A to R to R. And this is now mixing in a little bit of synchrony and asynchrony. It's, it's allowing you to kind of do computations and pause them and resume them. And it kind of bakes all that stuff in. And, and this has all of those, all those compositional operators. And so then we come across something like this. And this is a little bit different. If we had a predicate type, we would maybe say, all right, we're going to have a predicate library. And I want to start defining map, zip, flat map, and, and choose, and all these different things. And what you would find is it's impossible to implement map on this signature. It's like act, if you just sit down and try to write it. And if you, sit, and you try to think through what it means, you're like, all right, if I had a predicate on a user, could I map on it and then turn that into a predicate on integers, where I maybe like pluck out their ID or something like that? But that doesn't really make a lot of sense because just because I have a predicate of a user, I then want to derive a predicate of an integer, but I, I only have at hand my predicate on a user. So I would need to somehow construct a user so I could feed it into that predicate, get some kind of Boolean out of it, and then that's what I could return from my other predicate. This, this just is going the wrong direction. There's something weird happening here. And it just it turns out that the, the, the direction is going wrong. You, it, it, it is impossible to go A to B and then get a predicate of A to B, but it is possible if you had a function that went from B to A, you could then take a predicate of A and turn to a predicate of B's. Somehow just by doing that little flip, this opens up like new possibilities. And this is like even stranger. Like we're, this is like a new form of like some kind of exotic composition we're seeing in this, in the zoo where you somehow like have to flip arrows. You have to look at it in a mirror and then all of a sudden you, you get something out of it. Um, <clears throat> Then also weird, it's not possible to define flat map on this. And this is, this is very subtle. You can define zip, but it's, not, it's actually not zip. And it's hard to explain why, but this zip isn't exactly what you think it is. And, and so there's even, there's even more things lurking in here that, that, that need to be developed. So we've seen now predicates, async values, continuations, parsers, random number generators, all those allow you, you define these operators and you get to break complex problems down into simple problems. Turns out completely different than all those, snapshot testing also fits into this world in which you can define a, a family of types that describe the, the, the process of how you could do snapshot testing, the, the bare essentials of how do you uh, compare two values to see if they're different? Uh, how do you serialize values to disk and then deserialize them from disk? How do you turn values into snapshotting formats? All these, all of these types here. I'm not going to go through all the, the details, but this encapsulates the idea of snapshot testing. And um, you would construct values of these these structs to, in order to describe how do I snapshot some value into some format, and and you and you could use it by asserting snapshots on 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 various values as various uh, strategies or formats. So you could snapshot any user model as a dump, where you just do like Swift dump. Uh, you could, if it's encodable, you could snapshot as a JSON. You can snapshot URL request as a curl representation of it. View controllers as images. This is probably like the most common one. Um, if you're a third party library that was making a PDF library, you could snapshot your data types into PDFs. And you could also snapshot like animations. Uh, but again, snapshot doesn't have map. It's impossible to implement this function, but it is possible to implement this other function, this pullback function. Um, and what this allows you to do is it allows you to take base units of snapshotting and pull them back to larger and larger forms of snapshotting, where you, if you had a base unit of snapshotting UI images, which is pretty straightforward to implement, but it, like, it takes some time to do, you could then instantly get the concept of snapshotting CA layers, where you take the image pullback, the image snapshotting strategy, and you pull it back by then rendering a CA layer into a UI image. Like the direction keeps on like flipping on us, but but this is this is how it goes. And then once you have that layer strategy, you can define the view snapshotting strategy by pulling it back and then plucking out the layer from the view and then snapshotting that. And then you can define a view controller strategy by taking the view strategy, pulling it back by plucking out the view from the controller and then snapshot that. Um, and then and and Stephen and I open source a library with all this stuff. And there's really only two strategies, a string snapshotting strategy and a, a UI image snapshotting strategy. And every other strategy from animations to anything, all are pullbacks from that. So this is like a composable 
snapshot testing library. The fact that you can define a couple of core units of snapshotting and from that derive any other kind of snapshot you could imagine. But then it keeps going. Like there's other, like even application architecture can be thought in these ways in which you have base units that are composable and you start defining operations on that. And in order to transform them from little tiny units into much bigger complex units. And if you settle on a composable unit, such as a reducer, you can repeat all the stories that we're doing for parsers and random number generators, anything. You can do it for architecture, app architecture, or whatever. So if you settled on a base unit of a reducer, the idea that you have some mutable state, that you have an action that comes in from the user and it allows you to advance, evolve the state from your current state to the next one, but then also return some effects, this, this like signature emits lots of different compositions. First of all, you can take two of them and cram them together by just running the first reducer, then run the second reducer and get a whole new reducer. Um, it does not support map. It does not even support pullback. Just because you have a transformation from T to S does not mean you can change reducers of S into reducers of T, unfortunately. Oh, you know what? This next slide is going to look messed up. Let's just go for it. I think I, I had a comment there. Um, and so, um, yeah, just look above the comment. Act like you can't see the comment. <laughs> um, but what? Uh, but what it does support is if you if you enhance instead of just going a function from T to S, if you allowed writable key paths from T to S, all of a sudden the composition unlocks. So this function impossible to implement. This function above the comment possible to implement and is the base unit of what you need in order to transform reducers. And this story also plays out for actions where just because you can transform A's into B's does not mean you can uh, transform reducers of state A to re reducers of state B. You can't pull them back. You can't even pull them, pull them back along keypads. You need something else. It turns out there's something else that you even need here. There's like some other exotic thing lurking in here. And um, it just turns out that key paths are great for plucking out parts of a struct. You get to like focus in on various fields of a struct. You kind of need the same thing, but for enum. So if there, this isn't a concept that exists in, in Swift, but maybe someday it would, and this would allow you to do what you can do with key paths and structs. What if you could do that with enums? Uh, and so you can define this thing and then, and then you would get a new form of composition. And this is how you take a large application, a large reducer that's running all of your logic, all the business logic for your entire application, and break it down into little tiny reducers that each do their own little thing while still allowing them to be pulled back, combined together into one big mega, like mega reducer. Just like we did for random number generators, parsers, or whatever. Like this is allowing us to do that same thing, but for application architecture. Um, even more wild, even build systems fit into this world. Um, the, this paper describes how you could write down some base unit of types of how to describe a build system and then look at what, what kind of transformations do they support. And when you do that, you get a lot of clarity of, of what is the difference between like Bazel, Buck, and Nix, and all these things. You get, you get clarity because it just turns out that, like for example, uh, Buck uses a topological sort on its tasks. And this means that Buck when put in this formality, supports a zip operation, but does not support a flat map operation. Uh, whereas on the other hand, Nix has this idea of uh, running tasks when they're requested and suspending tasks until it finishes. And, that, and that's very flat map, like you're kind of sequencing things together. And so you just get clarity by, by searching for this kind of uh, composition. And so, so all right, we're, we're towards the end of it. And so it's like a very wild world there. The, the fact that we could draw a line from something obviously composable, like a function, all the way to app architecture, build systems, random number generators, parser, snapshot testing, all these things are the story like repeats over and over. You, you take your, your base problem and you try to express it in a, in a nice little base unit. And then you try to try to discover what kind of compositions are, are lurking there. What little things can you do? Can you define map on it? Can you define zip on it? Can you define flat map? Can you combine them? Can you like do these things? Um, and this is, I think, like the interesting thing of this stuff is, is seeing so many examples of composition and, and trying to find it in, in your own types, in the way you're, you're structuring things and, and, and what, what other like forms of composition are, are out there. 
Um, and, and you could even, even take like an existing library and see what, what is it doing that is like preventing it from, from getting composition. Like, like snapshot testing has been around for a very long time. Facebook had their library many years ago and it's, it was a great library. I think they transferred it to someone, maybe Uber and, but it's not what you would think of as composable because you never think of snapshot testing in that way. And so you can take an existing library and kind of try to tweak it so that you can get composition out of it so that you can start breaking down complex things into smaller things. Um, okay, so that's that's the end of it. Um, I, 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 yeah, I, I, it's like a lot to to take in the kind of the thing I was hoping to to convey is the idea that there is a very wild world of composition out there and I want us to have like a solid, definition that we can all kind of agree on and then and then see where does that lead us and and that's it thanks yeah, yeah. all right thank you brandon for the lovely talk does anyone have any questions please raise your hand i think we can probably get to three questions We'll let you digest all that composition for a minute. A uh, very interesting talk. Um, in terms of thinking about compositional thinking, are there any places where it can lead you astray? Is there downsides to compositional uh, thinking? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, especially in a language which maybe does not embrace composition as a, like a like it's. Oh, yeah, sorry. Let me start again. Uh, definitely in a language like Swift, which maybe composition is not necessarily supposed to be the thing you reach for immediately, you would run into a situation of maybe performance problems. You maybe, if everything is functions, you're picking up stack frames with every single composed function. And in a lot of cases, that could be bad. Uh, Swift has made huge um, improvements there, though. Uh, in fact, we've done benchmarks on parsers and random number generators of the, the like composed parser version versus hand rolled, like literally writing line by line imperative style with almost no difference between the two because Swift is getting very good at removing those those things. So definitely, but that that still, even though Swift is getting better, there is always that possibility because because it is very functional, like, you know, composition stuff you and Swift is not is not that's not their priority is to optimize those things you could always have a performance problem yeah i guess another problem also is education with your colleagues if if you're excited about it and they're not so excited about it then that's going to be a drawback too any other questions all right we have one here and then we'll go there Um, I'm wondering if you have any suggestions on uh, when you try to look at a brand new problem or looking at a library, uh, is there any sort of way you look for the composition? A anything you can say around that? Uh, at, its, at its like core, it would be at the very least looking at a generic type because this is also uh, applicable to pretty much just generic types for the most part, especially map, zip, flat map, and stuff like that. And just simply like actually sit down and try to write the implementation of those things. And then more importantly, to understand intuitively what those operations mean for each of those things. Because map zip and flat map mean something wildly different depending on the type you're looking at. Um, and it's it's kind of going through those exercises. Uh, and you could also literally look up some weird types in like Haskell, just look at their type signature, their type definition, and then go try to implement map zip and flat map by yourself and try. Try thinking in that way of you know I've got my base unit of of generic my like library thing that's describing something, but I really want to be able to like transform it in, in particular ways and just going through those exercises to to try to implement the functions. Some some types do not support these operations, and so that's also important is to know when you are trying to find it not to force it if it actually can, like you know uh, map on predicates like the compiler simply won't compile, but then other types. You would maybe have to fudge it in order to get it like working how you think it's supposed to be working and that also becomes interesting to see where what types just simply do not support it um yeah so. 
All right, let, let's take two more. Um, uh, I'm kind of curious around for the random generation part uh, for compositionality, because kind of there's mutation involved. And so the definition of how a compose could be both correct and incorrect at the same time, because if you care about, say, consistent generation of like, oh, every time I compose the same uh, set of operations, I produce the same value at the exact same time, that in this example, perhaps is like not composable from that definition. Yeah, so so it is composable in the sense that we are using mutation, but we could also just as easily not do in out RNG to A, but instead take an RNG and then return a brand new RNG and also an A. Those two signatures are completely equivalent. Yes, yeah. uh, and so, but I guess the question then is like, is that violating the compositionality of it or is it just saying, just making it more functional will no, it's it's not violating the composition in that case because then you you truly are returning a whole new value. You're in a whole new world. Uh, the thing, if and also an important aspect of this is that it's completely lazy. You're you're the when you're mapping on these things and doing things, you're not running the generator. It's not until you hit dot run and then pass it a mutable thing is anything actually being mutated. And so in the in the abstract of a generator, those compositions are like doing their thing just fine. And then at the very last moment, you do dot run and hand it a system random number generator if you want like true randomness or a pseudo random number generator if you want predictableness. And then if you give it a pseudo random number generator, you will actually get, you'll get the exact same value every single time you run it. So it is, it is sitting there. The, the nice, like the pure thing is sitting there. Yeah, so there was kind of a bunch of topics that were all related, but maybe not combined in terms of like, if anyone wants to go and adopt any of this stuff, how would you give advice for sort of gradual adoption, keeping in mind uh, like API design, sub, like the subjective nature of a lot of our work, people's comfort level. Um, there's kind of like an unknown path from the stuff we talked about tonight to like adopting the best parts as low hanging fruit and then going from there. Yeah, well, it's, it, yeah, because all the topics are so wildly different, it's hard to give like the overarching name, but if, for example, parsing is something that is surprisingly all over code bases. Like we don't even realize how much we're doing parsing, but we're doing it in a very ad hoc way. And so the idea would be how much of that, par I mean, just the, the fact of trying to turn a string into an integer, we've got failable initializers all over the place underneath the hood, they're doing parsing for us. And so the idea is, is if you notice enough parsing happening in ad hoc disparate ways across your code base, you would want to see, oh, can I unify these things by just like using a proper like parser? Um, and then what can I even share across like super disparate areas of my code base to allow this kind of parsing? Um, and so then I guess as so the the like the team education part of it is like a very difficult one. This is like you would need the ability to actually prove to your colleagues that that there is like power here that there is something to gain from from these things um and and this is you know every team is, is going to be different um is in my experience it's just been the the idea of i mean you know we no longer use for loops right like we do map like you you do like we all are very comfortable doing array dot map we're no longer you know setting up our indices and then incrementing them and and everything like that. And so all of this stuff is the evolution of that, a far, far evolution. And it takes a long time to go from that to like the stuff we discussed. But but the the like the story, that is the story. Um, and so I guess that's how I would think of it. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, Brandon.